Hi there, this is Dr. John Bergsma from the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology and Franciscan University of Steubenville. And we have a great feast day this day, which would normally be Friday of the 18th week of Ordinary Time. But in this year, it is the Feast of the Transfiguration. This is a big event. Uh, let's try to make an extra effort to get to Mass today on this Holy Feast. Uh, the Transfiguration, of course, is a big event in the life and ministry of our Lord. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke are all agreed that the Transfiguration marked the beginning of the end. It was the end of the early part of our Lord's ministry and the beginning of his journey toward Jerusalem, where he knew he would experience his passion, his death, and ultimately his resurrection. So the transfiguration is a very sobering moment in the Gospels when there is a switch from the acclaim and the crowds and the miracles that have uh, characterized our Lord's ministry up to that point with his popularity. And now things become somber as increasingly the reality of the opposition to Jesus from the leadership of the people of Israel is going to be more and more manifest until uh, his death results. So if you remember the movie Sound of Music and after the wedding of uh, Maria and um, uh, the Count von Trapp, um, we have that scene where the uh, bell is tolling for the wedding and at first it's very happy and then that tolling bell becomes ominous and it shifts to kind of a minor key. And uh, then we launch into that uh, experience of the Anschluss where Nazi Germany takes over Austria and the Von Trapp family singers have to flee, etc. So that marks a turning point in the movie towards uh, greater somberness and seriousness, and the transfiguration is like that. It's more like the wedding, which is happy and glorious, but then afterwards things become uh, darker in the ministry of our Lord. So that's a little introduction to the significance of this event in our Lord's uh, life and ministry. Now let's look at our readings for today. Our first reading is Daniel 7. As I watched, thrones were set up, and the Ancient One took his throne. His clothing was bright as snow, and the hair on his head was as white as wool. This is an appearance of an image of God the Father. This is a very interesting passage here in Daniel 7, because although it's an Old Testament text, it is beginning to reveal to us multiple persons in the Godhead. Uh, two persons of the Trinity come to light in this vision that Daniel has, the Father and the Son. Uh, the Spirit is also present here in other images, less clearly so. But uh, his throne was flames of fire, it says, and the wheels of burning fire, this fire uh, that's described also as a surging stream of fire flowing out from where he sat. That is a sign of the Holy Spirit. Thousands upon thousands are ministering to him, etc., as the visions during the night continued, I saw one like a son of man coming on the clouds of heaven. Okay, riding on the clouds was a sign of being a god. And the chief god in the religions of most ancient peoples was the one who rode on the clouds. So Jupiter, Zeus, Baal, uh, Thor in different cultures, they were all weather gods. They were the chief god and they rode on the clouds and they controlled the weather. That was the sign of the head of the pantheon, the head of uh, the assembly of the gods. So one like a sound of man coming on the clouds of heaven, he is a divine person, although he is mysteriously also human. So very interesting, right? When he reached the ancient one that was presented before him, the one like a son of man received dominion, glory, and kingship, all peoples, nations, and languages serve him. So he receives divine kingship from this uh, image of God the Father. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not be taken away. His kingship shall not be destroyed. Well, of course, what's going on in this passage is Daniel is foreseeing in a symbolic and theologically rich way um, the basic uh, incarnation and ministry of our Lord such that our Lord is going to come into this earth 
looking like a son of man, indeed being a son of man, that is to say a human being, and yet he is going to receive eternal dominion and the kingdom of God from his uh, father. So that passage serves as a uh, good background then for our gospel reading, which is Mark's account of the transfiguration. We are in year B, which is the year of Mark. And so we read these important events uh, of our Lord's life from uh, each of the uh, three gospels in the three different years, Matthew and A, Mark and B, Luke and C. So next year we will be reading this account from Luke. But this year it is from Mark. And we read about how Jesus took Peter, James, and his brother John up on a high mountain apart by, uh, by themselves. Uh, traditionally, this is identified with Mount Gabor, um, the same mountain, by the way, that um, uh, uh, the judges, uh, Deborah and um, uh, Barak, uh, took the Israelite forces up to, uh, to wait uh, to attack their enemies in Judges 4 and 5. Just a little trivia there. But um, this is the Mount of Transfiguration, and there's a beautiful chapel to the Transfiguration on the top of this mountain, if you ever go on pilgrimage to land of Israel uh, to this day. And uh, up on this high mountain, he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no fuller on earth could bleach them. And Elijah appeared to them along with Moses, and they were conversing with Jesus. Why Elijah and Moses? First, these are two Old Testament figures, both of whom did not die and become buried, but both of whom were assumed into heaven. Uh, Moses may have died, but his body was not buried. It was assumed, at least according to Jewish tradition. There was an ancient work called The Assumption of Moses that described that. And Elijah, of course, was taken up in uh, a whirlwind. And uh, so the, uh, the people of Israel believed that Moses and Elijah were already uh, in heaven with God and thus able to come back. And uh, I believe they were correct because here we see them um, uh, speaking with our Lord. Also, Moses and Elijah represent the law and the prophets, which were the two divisions of the Jewish uh, Bible. And uh, so they're conversing with Jesus, who re represents the New Testament and the and the gospel. So we have, you know, as it were, embodiments of the scriptures conversing with one another. Then Peter said to Jesus in reply, Rabbi, it's good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Because at this point, Peter only understands our Lord to be a great prophet like these great Old Testament prophets, does not understand Jesus' superiority to them. And so he hardly knew what, he, what to say. A cloud came, cast a shadow, and from the cloud came a voice. This is the glory cloud of the Lord that we saw in the Exodus, that cloud that led the people of Israel, Israel that cloud that came down and filled the tabernacle. This is the cloud of God's presence. And the, the voice from the cloud says, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. The key phrase here is my beloved son. This is a reference to Genesis 22 where Isaac three times in the ancient Greek translation of Scripture, the Septuagint, is called the beloved son of Abraham. So we're seeing Jesus as a new beloved son, a new Isaac here. Remember, Isaac was the one who gave his life in sacrifice uh, at the command of God. Also, David's name means beloved one. So beloved son recalls uh, David to mind as well. And our Lord is also a new David, a new king over God's people. So new Isaac, new David, listen to him. And suddenly looking around, they no longer saw anyone but Jesus alone with them. And the message there is Jesus is so superior to other prophets that come before that he is the fullness of God's revelation in himself. In a sense, there's not even the need for the other prophets anymore because God's complete word is incarnate in Jesus. And as they were coming down from the mountain, he charged them not to relate what they had seen to anyone except when the Son of Man had risen from the dead. When Jesus speaks of himself as the Son of Man, he's thinking of that Son of Man figure from Daniel 7 who is given the kingdom of God. The term Son of Man does not emphasize Jesus' humanity. Son of Man emphasizes Jesus' cosmic royalty. Because in the scriptural tradition, the Son of Man is the one who's going to be given universal 
dominion over the cosmos. Let's remember that when we see that in uh, Scripture. And so they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what rising from the dead meant. Okay, so this is the beginning in the Gospels of our Lord's journey now toward Jerusalem for the rest of Mark, rest of Matthew, rest of Luke, etc. He's journeying towards Jerusalem to face his passion. The transfiguration is an anticipation of Calvary. Remember how on Calvary our Lord is crucified with two thieves on either side. Here he's glorified with two saints on either side, Moses and Elijah. The transfiguration where our Lord appears in glory is a visible sign of the glory of Jesus, which will be veiled at Calvary. Actually, the glory of Jesus at Calvary is greater even than the glory of Jesus at the transfiguration, but it is veiled uh, by sin and suffering. But if we have the eyes of faith, we can see that the love of God poured out through the death of his only son is so much greater a revelation of God's majesty than any visible signs of power could ever be. But the transfiguration, again, is an anticipation and a foretaste of the glorification of Christ, which is actually going to take place on Calvary. From this point on in the church year, our eyes begin to turn toward uh, that, uh, that mystery of Christ's kingship, which is uh, shown on the cross when that title is put over his head. This is the King of the Jews. Well, this has been Dr. John Bergsman from the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology and Franciscan University of Steubenville, wishing you a very happy Feast of the Transfiguration.